Hey everybody, welcome to week four. Class is looking a little sparse tonight. I don't know, probably because it's not so damn hot outside and everybody's like, I don't need the air conditioning anymore. And besides, it's Wednesday. Felicity is on tonight or something. I, Felicity's not on anymore. Is it? I, I, you know, it's a recurring joke in the class. Anyway, um, cool. So, um, Let's see here. Uh, on the docket tonight, I uh, want to talk about uh, part two is due tonight. I want to talk about some of the, you know, your experiences there. Um, wanted to, uh, that light flickering is really going to be bothering me. Um, uh, wanted to uh, introduce and assign project four. Um, this is a client server web application. It is sort of a order of magnitude more complex than the first three projects uh, in terms of the things you need to understand. I hope you uh, took the opportunity to review the foundations of the web, either the slides or the screencasts um, before coming to class tonight because uh, some of that stuff will be, well, a lot of that stuff is what you'll be doing in your project for. Um, and once we get all of that out of the way, um, then I want to do some more pair and mob programming um, on a, a, little, a kata that's a little bit more interesting than the one last week. Um, you know, I was thinking about the, the fizz buzz, and I think a lot of the, the some of the feedback that you guys gave me was like, "This is really easy. Why don't you do this test-driven development?" And you're right. Um, the the converting numbers to words I think will be a little bit more complex, and um, it'll be a little bit more approachable to do TDD style. So uh, that's what I'm thinking about tonight. Um, so uh, let's start off. Uh, project two was due. Saw some good questions on the the community. What did you guys think? Um, any open questions that, that you have or things you'd like to bring to my attention? No life-changing experiences like, damn, that was the best project I ever did. I'm going to go out and get a job writing text parsers professionally. And okay, making sure. Got your expectations set proper, properly. Okay. Um, project three, uh, I know some of you have started on it already. It's due next week. Any questions on that? Um, on the uh, the pretty printing or the date formatting or uh, anything like that. No, man. How are you feeling about it? Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Next week the cones are also due. Um, hope you're mostly done with those. Uh, I saw some from some of the questions that people have uh, got them finishing, but not necessarily all saying that they're passing. That's weird. Um, I'll uh, try to carve some time to look into that. Um, and if there's you know, a bug there or whatever, we'll certainly take that into account when, when grading. Okay, so anything about the sort of the content that we've discussed to date? Any uh, ideas that you had, any observations you had uh, over the last week that you'd like to share? We're all about sharing here. Yeah? Quick question on cons. Yeah. Uh, I got that row here. And, uh, I'm just going to submit it so you can take a look at it. Yeah. Uh, how are we submitting this? Just go in to the source. I thought. Uh, I think that's actually. I hope I put it in the. Uh, 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 well, let me just double check. <laughs> that's, although some people have submitted it. What? what does anyone remember what they did? I. No. Oh yeah, the submit. You say cone source. Apparently, right? reading is fundamental. Anyway. Okay. Cool. Um. So uh, off, right, right off the bat, uh, did you guys have an opportunity to watch the Reflection and Foundations of the Web screencasts? Um, any questions or like you know, big que questions before we get started, before we dive into the Project 4? Did the Reflection stuff make sense? Sorry, you, you were about to say something and I cut you off. No? Yeah, you. No? Okay. <laughs> nope, kind of an advanced topic. The web stuff. Has anybody done web programming job? Well, has anybody done? You guys know what the web is, right? Just make, making sure. Okay, good. Uh, anybody ever done uh, web programming? Maybe not in Java or like, you know, PHP or any server side stuff? JavaScript. JavaScript, okay, on the client side. Anything on the server side? Okay. Um, so then, okay, that's, that's good for me to know because some of these concepts might be very then new to you and, uh, and, and stuff like that. Okay, and that's cool. Okay. So if there are no sort of questions, let's dive into Project 4. So to date, in the first three projects, um, it's basically like your, you know, 1980s style software assignment, right? Uh, everything's one program. 
Uh, it reads from the command line. It writes to text files. It uses punch cards. Right? Okay, it's, it's kind of old school. Um, and, uh, and, and that is meant to get you familiar with the Java programming language, hopefully doing tasks that are similar to the things that you've done in other classes, like you know, parsing string data, write, reading and writing from files, things like that. Um, in the second half of the course, uh, we move into the 90s um, by doing web stuff. Uh, and we move into the, you know, uh, the, no, the 2000s in, uh, in, the, in Project 5 where we do stuff with a rich internet application. But with Project 4, um, we, we build what's called a RESTful web service. Now, as you, you know, saw in the, uh, in the slides, REST is a, uh, is, is a language over, um, uh, over HTTP for uh, getting data, creating data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what you have is uh, URLs that when you hit them with uh, certain, uh, certain query parameters, they return data. You can use those same URLs to, uh, to create data, things like that. So in, in Project 4, what you do is you uh, take your uh, phone bill application and you turn it into a web service. That, uh, and you'll have Java code that's both for the server, for serving up information out of your phone bill, and then you'll also have Java code, which is the client to that service, which makes HTTP calls to do things like add phone calls to phone bills and get information um, about the phone bill. So the goal is here is that I, I want you to do some web programming in Java. Now, it's all still Java, but now there are, are a couple of um, uh, I I interesting complications, there are a couple of interesting features. The first is that uh, you're doing distributed programming, meaning that you have two programs running at the same time. One is your server, which is a Java program that uh, stays running, that you launch and it runs, um, and sits there and waits for a client to connect to it. And that's the other Java program, is your client. So uh, you've got two programs running at the same time, both from the same code base, which is a little different, than things that you might have seen before. So as an, here again, another sort of complexity to keep in mind. And the way these two programs communicate is over HTTP, which is you know, the protocol in which, with which the web is built. Here again, you can get more details about that stuff in the, uh, in the lecture on, on the YouTube. So what do I want you to do in this, uh, for this assignment? Well, there's something called a servlet, and a servlet is a Java object that responds to HTTP requests. Um, we'll see, uh, 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 well, we'll see shortly um, what the archetype creates for you, uh, but there's this class called phone bill servlet, um, and it responds to uh, HTTP requests, and that provides your, your REST API, uh, REST API to your phone call. And so when you run this servlet, which is embedded inside a web container called Jetty, uh, well, a web container, and the one that we'll be using is called Jetty, uh, when you hit this URL, so whatever host and port it's running on, slash phone bill, slash calls, question mark, customer equals name, with a get, um, HTTP GET, that will return all the calls in the phone bill formatted using a pretty printer. So you're reusing your pretty printer class from project three, but now instead of using it from a command line application, uh, what you're doing is you are, uh, uh, you are using it to respond to an HTTP, HTTP GET request um, from a client. If you hit that URL with a POST, uh, HTTP POST, that'll create a new phone call um, from uh, request parameters uh, named customer, caller number, callee, callee number, start time, and end time. So instead of having a command line application that specifies what the new uh, phone call should be, actually it's an addition to, but uh, here on the server, the, the server's interface isn't the command line, right? The server's interface is HTTP, and when you want to create a phone call, you, uh, you use the HTTP POST. With me so far? Wishing you had watched the YouTube beforehand? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's okay. It says right there before class. I'm gonna call you on it this time. Okay, um, and note that if you try to uh, create a, uh, uh, well, the first time you create a phone call, if the phone bill doesn't exist, create a new one. Um, oh, something important to note here, um, the phone bill does not persist, uh, how do I say this? The phone bill is stored in memory. You don't write it out to a file. And that's fine because you've got a web server. You bring it up and it stays up. So you're gonna have multiple HTTP requests that are doing things to it, that are asking for the phone bills, that are creating more phone calls, all that good stuff. Um, and the server will stay up. 
in a real world application, of course, if the server goes down, you want to save your data. Um, this isn't real world. Uh, it's hard enough, uh, you know, as it is. So that's one URL that your uh, that, that your application supports. The other URL um, is uh, consists of uh, here again a slash calls, but here you provide a customer name and then also a start time and an end time. And what this does is it queries the phone bill. It's stored in the server there. Um, and, uh, oh, returns all of the, the phone bill's calls, pretty prints, that should probably say, um, all of the uh, phone bill's calls that occur between the start time and the end time. So this is a new piece of functionality, right? Your command line application doesn't do this. This is a new piece of functionality that you'll need to um, implement uh, for, your, for your server. At a high level, do you understand what those uh, what, what what that server side part of it's doing? More or less, okay. So you'll write a servlet class that provides the server side functionality, and you'll also pr provide a project four class, which is the client. So this is a command line application that instead of working with your classes directly like your project 3 does, right? Your project 3 goes and it uses your text parser to create a phone bill and then it reads from the command line, creates a phone call from that and adds it to the phone bill and then uses your text number to write it back out again. Oh yeah, you can pre-print in there too. So all there, all the domain logic is on, in one application. In project 4, we've split that logic between two applications, two programs. One is the server side stuff that does all the things I just described and then the, the client side, project 4, well, it's still a command line application, so it parses the command line, so that logic stays on the, uh, on the client side. Uh, but now, instead of interacting with your, uh, with your application classes directly, it makes calls to the server to do the work. So um, the command line looks the same as we're, we're used to, so those five uh, arguments for customer, caller number, customer, caller number, callee number, start time, and end time. Um, and there are some different options in, in this assignment. Uh, so for instance, the command line um, program uh, no longer reads a text file or whatever. Nope, all the, all the phone bill information, that's on the server. So instead it has options for interacting with the server. So you can specify the host name and port of the, uh, of the server. Uh, you, can, you still have print and readme like you did before. And by the way, your readme should be updated for project forward, say, and that does different stuff. And then there's this new option, search. And when search is provided, um, only the customer start time and end time uh, arguments are required. And what it should do is it should pretty print to standard out all of the phone numbers made between those two times. So uh, project four has the ability to create a new uh, a phone call in the phone bill that's stored in the server, and also the ability to search. And the way it does it is by invoking these URLs. So we're used to putting URLs into a web browser and like, you know, seeing some web page and stuff, right? Um, and that's, and in that case, your browser is your client, right? Your browser is the one that makes the request and then takes the, uh, takes the response and renders it. Well, here we're writing a Java program that makes an HTTP request and then takes the results and does something with it, like spits out to a command line or, um, or adds a new phone call, um, things like that. But, the HTTP protocol is the same, and the web server doesn't really care what the client is. As a matter of fact, as we'll see, you can hit these URLs with, uh, with, with a web browser, and it'll do its thing. Um, that's the, one of the nice things about separating out the client functionality from the server functionality. Okay, so you sort of understand at a high level what this program program assignment's all about. Some new functionality you need to add, and then, oh yeah, by the way, there's this whole client server thing. Okay, getting interesting. Okay. Oh yeah, and it's worth like 13 points, because it's harder, um, and so that means there's more stuff for us to test. Anyway, um, okay, oh yeah, yeah, so some error handling. Um, don't, uh, let's see here, oh yeah, host and port, um, you can't do one without the other, so either they're both there or neither of them are there. So here's some examples, um, you know, running your project four, uh, you can add a phone call to the server like this, and then when you search, um, you don't need uh, the phone numbers. All you should have is just the customer name, the start time, and the end time. And oh, by the way, we're using the 12-hour time format for, for this project. 
graceful error handling all around, um, and now some more interesting stuff can happen. So of course there's like, you know, oh, you can't parse the command line, but now also, oh, look, I can't connect to the server on the host and port that was specified. Things like that, that you, um, you know, ought to be, that you should accommodate in your client. Okay, yeah. Uh, so what does it do if we don't specify a host and port? <sighs> Degrade to project one. <laughs> Right, basically, yeah, right. It's it's like yeah, you can use the dash print option. You can. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna bother to test that. That's you know terribly interesting. So just be graceful. I don't know. Have a little ASCII art of like a ballerina or something. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, for the search option, if they provide more information than is required, should it error out or should it just ignore? Uh. Yeah, let me take a look at the example. I, I think that should be an error, actually, which does complicate the command line parsing, I admit. Um, yeah. yeah. OK. So any other questions about sort of the assignment or what the requirements are? OK. Uh, since web programming is new to a bunch of you, I want to take some time here in class while we're all together to uh, Go through the archetype, and I'll show you some of the pieces, parts, um, to give you an idea of, of how you work with this beast. So, um, okay, here I am in my code. I will create. Let's see here, I don't have a phone bill project already. I will blow up because it's got all sorts of wrong stuff in it. Okay, gotta fix the tilde. Gotta fix the login. Okay, this is a different archetype. So this this will create an archetype for the web application, not the um, not like the, the project one archetype. So all this good stuff, it goes and it creates a project. It says, "Is this what you want?" Yes, that's what I want. Okay, great. Now it's got something called phone bill. Um, and oh, it's got all sorts of things. Probably the easiest thing to do is just to add all this to get um, all sorts of good stuff. Yes, git commit uh, added files from phone bill web archetype. OK, push that to GitHub. OK, so now that I've got this, um, I'm going to open it up in IntelliJ. Let's close that out. Um, and I will yeah, just open up that palm. And phone bill. New project. Now let's reuse that window. Save a tree. OK. Yes, I had the root. OK, so what did uh, the, the archetype create me all sorts of cool things? So there's some Java code. Um, there's, well, there's source and there's test. Let's look at the source code. So uh, there's a package. Great. And it's got, some, uh, it's got a couple of classes. It's got project four, which is, sure enough, this is my command line application. It has uh, a servlet, and so that servlet thing is on the server side. And then it's got this phone bill REST client, which extends HTTP request helper. And we can talk about that um, also. It's got also in the source directory, it doesn't have Java code, it has something called web app. Now web app uh, contains this web.xml, which is a descriptor file that describes the web application. So as you'll uh, see in the, um, in, in the lecture, uh, Java web applications are run inside something called a web container. A web container is a, is a, is a, is a program, a, a, almost always written in Java itself, which um, is a web server. And so it listens on some port, like port 80, which is a default HTTP port, or 8080, which is like what Java applications often use, for HTTP requests. And the web container, um, it has all the logic of taking that HTTP request, which is, well, just a bunch of strings, um, in the use following the HTTP uh, hypertext transport protocol, um, 
and uh, it knows how to parse all that out. And what it ends up doing is uh, takes that request and it routes it to what's called a web application running inside that web container. And a web application is, is Java code that handles that request. What one of the things the container does is it takes that raw HTTP and, uh, and converts it into objects that are then delivered to your Java code. And there are objects that do things like represent, well, here's the request. Here's what the URL was. Here's what the parameter was. Here's what the cookies are. Um, here's like what user was logged in, right? It's got all this stuff. Um, and all this stuff is, is uh, uh, encompasses something called the servlet API. So a servlet um, is like a little server um, that runs inside your, uh, your web container. Um, and so the servlet API provides, well, the servlet API is the contract between your uh, application code and the web container. And the servlet API, again, has uh, abstraction over request and then also abstraction over the response. And so what your um, servlet does is it uh, takes that request, gets the information it cares about out of it, does something based on it, and then sends something back in the response, which could be content, like maybe the request is asking for a file. Okay, right, you go find that file, you know, oh, it's the JPEG, here it is. Um, or maybe it's performing some operation, like adding a phone call to a phone bill. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, 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 the servlet does the work, sends back the response. Um, there's also the HTTP status code, which can convey errors, et cetera, et cetera. You know, watch it on the YouTube. Anyway, one of the pieces of information that your web application needs to provide the, the web container is information about the servlets. The servlets are the things that, uh, well, servlets are mapped to URLs, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the web XML, uh, this web app XML, basically tells the container, okay, when you, uh, uh, my web application will handle uh, URLs that end with slash calls, and when you get a request that ends in slash calls, please uh, route it over to the phone bill servlet. And phone bill servlet is basically defined right up here. Um, so you have to define your, your, your servlets, you give them a name, and then you also map them to a class. In this case, it's called phone bill servlet. This is the name up here, the name is used down here, and it's mapped to a class. So this is a little mapping file that tells the, the web container, okay, here's how you write requests. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, that's all we need to see there. Now, this is the servlet. Something to keep in mind as I'm talking about this. Um, we're working with two different Java programs. There's stuff on the client side and there's stuff on the server side, but they're all in Java. The source code's all in Java, and the way this um, the archetype is laid out, it's all in the same package. Which, now that I mention it, might be a little confusing, but you're smart people. Um, so anyway, but we keep that in mind as you're looking at this and definitely as you're doing your project. Okay, so this is a phone bill servlet. And what, uh, and what it does is it responds to these HTTP requests um, that end in that slash calls. And this ultimately is what you'll be implementing. You'll be changing the implementation of this class to do all the stuff of, on the server side of, of Project 4. Note that in its current form, though, what you get out of the archetype is a very simple in-memory key value database, um, uh, which, which in the past some people have found a little bit confusing trying to adapt that off to your phone bill servlet, but I wanted to give you something that worked out of the box, but that wasn't actually doing all of the work out of the box, if you know what I mean. Let's walk through this code and learn what happens on the server side. So you've got a phone bill servlet, which extends HTTP servlet. So HTTP servlet is um, part of that servlet API, and this provides the uh, standard contract for uh, well servlets that respond to HTTP. Um, there's an abstraction above servlet, which is like a general request response. Um, that's a nice abstraction. What we'll be using is the HTTP servlet. An HTTP servlet um, has a, a bunch of methods that you can override, such as do get. Now, the HTTP protocol um, defines a series of uh, seven, eight verbs, which is like, here's a, you know, there's a URL, here's something you can do to it. I can get the URL, I can post to the URL, I can put to the URL, I can delete from the URL. Um, if you've done any uh, web form programming, you're probably familiar with post, right? Get and post are the ones that are used in HTML, um, HTML forms. Uh, but the HTTP protocol actually uh, supports a number of different verbs. 
And the, uh, the, so the servlet API represents those verbs by these do methods. So there's a do get, there's a do post, yep, down here. Um, and then you can also you know, do delete, blah, 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 blah. So what your servlet does is it overrides the appropriate do method to handle that kind of HTTP request. So when, uh, when an HTTP request is made to the, uh, the slash calls URL, uh, that comes into the web container over the socket on port 8080 or whatever you're running on. The web container will pull apart the request, uh, you know, parse all of the HTTP headers and all that good stuff. And then uh, looks up in the mapping that was specified in your web.xml and says, ah, the URL ends in slash calls. This is a get um, of this URL. I will call do get. And by the way, it uses reflection to do all of that. Eh, it's relevant. Anyway. Um, barely. So anyway, so it does all this magical routing and stuff uh, in, in the web container. Um, and as part of the servlet API, there's a class called HTTP servlet request, which uh, represents the request. And it has uh, methods like, oh look, you can add cookies, you can send an error, I don't know if send error does. Uh, you can set status on the request. Sorry, that's the response that I'm looking at. No wonder I'm so confused. Uh, oh, what's a good way to do that? Fine. Request dot. Okay, so here's all the information you can get about the request. You can get the cookies, you can get the context path, which is like information about the URL. Um, headers, uh, HTTP headers, like for a given name, give it as an, get it as an int. All sorts of everything that you want. Um, here, and information also about authenticated users. Here again, this is all stuff that's part of the standard HTTP protocol. Um, and because it's standard, they wrote this web container that deals with all that standard stuff once, and then presents it to your Java code at Java objects. So it's easy for you to use. And so basically, you can develop web applications without having to be an expert in HTTP, uh, and certainly not without having to implement all that stuff yourself. And similarly, there's, there's the response. Okay, so what I get by uh, overriding this method is I say, okay, whenever there is an HTTP get that's sent to slash calls, execute this code. What does this code do? Well, we'll read the Java doc. Um, actually, back up one more step here. This servlet has one field, it's an instance field called data, and it's a map of string to strings. That's what it holds. So the, the, what, what the application that you get out of the box with the archetype, um, uh, simply maintains a map of strings to strings. Not very interesting, but then again, doesn't have to be. Um, so uh, I'm glad I wrote this down. So the, um, the the behavior of the get for this is that it looks for a parameter called key, and by parameter I mean you know the thing after the question mark on the URL, like you know blah equals blah. Okay, um, and it's called key, and uh, if if key is not specified then it prints out all of the key value pairs that are maintained in this map. Uh, otherwise, uh, it just returns the value of that one key. So let's walk through the code. The first thing that we're going to do is set the content type on the response, meaning that the data that this, uh, yeah, the, the data that this uh, response is going to return, um, its MIME type is text plain. Uh, so like one of the things in HTTP, it says, well, uh, hey, here's all the data that, that, that you asked for. Oh, by the way, here's its format. So it's like maybe you asked for something that is a JPEG. Great, its format is going to be uh, you know, image slash JPEG. This is going to be text plain, text HTML. Um, and, what, uh, and, and of course, the response needs to tell the, the client uh, this so the client knows how to handle it. Right, so that when your web browser sees it, it's like, oh, okay, this is a JPEG, I'm gonna draw it as a JPEG, as opposed to just like spitting out a bunch of text for however it's encoded. In this case, and actually for, well, yeah, for, for this application, you are just sending text over HTTP. So the first thing you're gonna do is configure a response like that. Um, and then we're gonna say there's a little helper method called get parameter that we will um, look at in a moment. We'll say, hey, from the request, give me the parameter, the value of the parameter named key. Um, that should probably be called value. It's a bad name. Right now, Uncle Bob is crying. There you go. Oh, 
that's wrong. OK, there you go. Um, so we go and uh, we'll ask the request, hey, did the user specify um, something associated with the uh, parameter named key? Get that value. If it's not null, then uh, we'll write it out to the response. Otherwise, we'll wrap all. Oh, sorry, we'll write the value out to the response. Otherwise, we'll wrap. We'll write all of the mappings. Okay, so this is like very simple because it's delegating a lot of work off these other methods. And remember, this is the this is part of the archetype. So you can use these same methods, um, at least things like get parameter in your own code. Okay, so what does get parameter do? Well, it takes the name of the parameter and takes the request, which is going to interrogate to figure out what the value is. So how does it do this? It calls the get parameter method on the request itself, um, and then it uh, checks to see whether it's null or if it's empty, um, which is the kind of the hokey stuff you need to do with HTTP. Um, if it is, then nope, wasn't specified, return null, other, null, otherwise return the value. So that's what get parameter does. These are small methods, so they're easy to, to digest. So that's how we get the, the value of the parameter. Then we'll, uh, okay, so if we did get something, we will write the value out. We take the uh, key. Oh, what? oh, I see. Oh, okay. Right. I'm sorry. This is wrong. That is not the value. So this is where it gets a little, a little tricky. Uh, the, maybe I should just run it for you to see what it looks like. Um, yeah, because then it might make a little more sense. Yeah, hold that thought. We'll push that on the stack, and then we'll do something else. Okay, so uh, this was a Maven project, and it, ha it has all this stuff. And the way that you, oh, oh okay. And um, I just forgot I'm not plugged in. So um, the uh, so, so you have this web container thing. The web container is the, the web server. And uh, it uh, implements the servlet API. And there are uh, a couple of um, open source, uh, and I guess there are probably still some closed source and still commercial uh, web uh, containers around. Um, and uh, one of them is called Jetty. Uh, it's, uh, and and it's, it's, it's known as sort of being a lightweight web container, really good for embedding. Um, and it's what we use here in, in this class. Um, and there is a Maven plugin that lets you do things with Jetty, like start up the server, deploy a web application to it, uh, stuff like that. Um, and uh, this is good for this class because it sort of takes care of all of the Jetty stuff for you. You can focus on writing your web application and not have to worry about um, managing all the Jetty stuff. So here in the assignment, uh, you can say, okay, Maven Jetty run. And this will construct the, uh, the web application, build that war file that I talk about in the lecture, compiles all the source code, uh, and now it's saying that, okay, great, I have started Jetty. Um, if you look here, uh, oh, here's the Jetty Maven plugin. We're running, here's the big version, here's the run goal uh, that, we're, that we're using. It's spinning all sorts of output, but basically what it's telling you is that, great, I'm you know, running on localhost 8080. So now let's go over to my web browser, I'll open up, oops, localhost 8080. It says, oh, I got a 404 not found, but it's nice to tell me, hey, you got something at phone bill. Okay, so there is a URL called phone bill. Um, phone bill represents the application that was deployed inside this jetty, and I want to hit the calls URL inside that phone bill, and saying, wait, you've got a server that contains zero key value pairs. Uh, and so now I want to have the key B, what's a good string key value? Apple? I don't know, we can put something in there. Apple, and it says that it contains zero, oh wait, is that right? It's key or the name? What does it call? Get parameter key. Oh, because the key was null, it wrote all the mappings. Okay. Uh, Oh, apple equals null. That's interesting. I wonder why I did that. Anyway, so that's how you run it. So you'll hit it like this. My point was is that key here, th th this must be the, the, the string key. Um, and that's what it gets from 
the request. So this, this what we're getting here really is the key that you're looking up in the map, not the which is the value of an HTTP parameter. Right, little okay. Uh, right. So anyway, so then when we write it out, we want to write out okay. Here's the the key to look up in the map. We look it up in the map to get the value, and then we need to uh, write it out. And so we get the print writer from the response. Now, print writer, as, as longtime viewers will recall, print writer is from the Java I.O. package. Look, they have an abstraction that represents a stream of text that is written out someplace. The server API didn't invent a new class to do this. They just reused the class from Java I.O. Yay! And this is really good, right? They didn't have to write a bunch of code, and now you can use exactly the same abstraction that you're used to. As a matter of fact, if you use print writer in other places in your code, well, you can send this print writer to that code and because everybody's programmed to the interface because you don't, you know, because who cares where the print writer came from or where it ultimately writes to, all this stuff can be wired together. Anyway, you can get the print writer from the, uh, from the HTTP response and this print writer represents, well, the stream of text, the, the, the text that is ultimately written back out to the client of the web server. But all that is abstracted for you, all you know is you've got some print writer and you're going to write to it. How are you going to write to it? Well, you're going to use print line. Um, I'll let you guys figure out what this messages class is all about. It's basically a nice way of getting strings um, that that I that I, uh, that I write out there. And you just call print line, and then you flush it, which sends all of the all of the uh, the buffered text, if any, out to the client. And then the last thing you want to do is uh, set the status code on the response. So you guys have seen like you know the 404 or the 200 OK and stuff like that. Well, HTTP uh, defines a set of status codes that represents the uh, well it, that, that yeah, represents information about the uh, about how happy your, uh, your 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 request handling was. And so that's what you're doing here. There's not a lot of code, but it does a lot. So that's if um, if we do have a value for the uh, for the key. And similarly, write all mappings. Um, doesn't bother to look up a key. It just goes and gets every, um, well, it's writing what you see. It's like, oh, okay, get mapping count is text like server contains blah, key value pairs. That's what we get here. I wonder why it, yeah, zero key value pairs. And it goes through everything in, the, uh, in that map, prints it out, it's empty right now, and then it flushes it and says to the status, okay. There's really no room for error handling in here because everything's in this map, and you're not going to get like a I/O exception when you're reading from a map in memory. Um, but uh, you know, see here in your eh, actually, and that's probably the same is true for your project four too. It's true for your project four also um, that you won't be doing too much error handling on the uh, on the server side. Although you might be doing things like validating parameters. I don't know. Okay. Uh, oh, missing requirement par required parameter. How is that used? Oh, on the post. Okay, right. So that's the get. So that basically gets information about the uh, about well th what's in the um, key value mapping. So I hope it's obvious to you. What you need to do is replace that functionality with getting stuff for your phone bill, um, mainly by and, and then. Um, either by uh, returning all of the calls for the uh, for the customer, or um, uh, or for calls uh, in a in a certain date range with a search operation. So that's getting information out of your server. Now let's talk about put, putting information into your server. The way you do that is with the, the with the post. So the post is an HTTP verb which is meant to uh, create data. Um, and so then when you create data, well, you need to specify that data to the, uh, to the application. And what data does the application model? Maps of strings. And so what do you need to do? You need to provide it a key and a value. Um, and so in your do post method, you get that same request and response, but now you're going to implement different logic. By the way, the return type is still going to be text plain, so you set that appropriately. Um, and now what we do is we get the key uh, parameter and the value parameter, um, and if if they're not uh, if they're not provided, then we blow up, then we issue an error. And actually, here's an example where we issue an error. So uh, it's it's basically telling you, hey, here's the parameter that should be required. 
We again get the print, uh, the, 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 the print writer from the response. We print some text to it saying, hey, you know, there was a required parameter is missing. But now the uh, what we set the status to isn't like a um, SC, which is SC, sort of a context? I don't know, whatever. Um, OK, and says a precondition failed, which is a HTTP 412. Okay, neat. Anyway, so that's how you convey errors. And then it's up to the client to figure out how to uh, uh, handle that appropriately. So for instance, the client, unless it receives a 200, unless it receives an HTTP OK, should do something like system.exits1 or whatever to then convey that out to the client. But we'll get to the client in a moment. Yep. Because, yep. I mean, it's really all part of the same application, right? And so um, th th this is, a, you know, you, you, we've gone from having an application that was a single program and a single code base to now a s single application that's distributed over two programs running at the same time, talking over HTTP, but they're dependent on one another, right? They, uh, you know, there's this, like, communication protocol between the two um, in terms of, like, I'll request on this URL, great, so I'll send you back this data, and I'll print your all that kind of stuff. Um, that's all part of the same application, so you need to implement both ends. Although I suppose, strictly speaking, as a little divergent, a little digression here, um, if you're... Uh, I think it might be possible. If everybody follows the same rules as outlined there, um, I could use one of yours client with another one of your server, right? Because the, um, the, the, the data protocol between the two is exactly the same. I, I never really thought of that before. So maybe I could have written the client for you. <laughs> well, you know. uh, come on, you're paying good money to write that client <laughs> and get the grade for it. OK, um, right, so that's post. And so, okay, sorry, let's go then back back here. So we're back in the do post. So it's like, great, the client has uh, provided the key, has provided the value, then what do I do? I put it in the map, all right? There's all my business logic right there. And then I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna write out the fact that it was, uh, that it was mapped. I'm gonna say map, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, flush out the output, and then say, yep, this, was, this request was handled, uh, was handled accordingly. So this is your server-side code. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's not a lot here. It's mostly about dealing with the HTTP request and HTTP response. That's because of the business logic here. You're putting and getting from a map, right? It's like one-line operations. Your business logic will be a little bit more complex because what you'll be doing is be calling your, uh, your, your, you'll be using your phone bill class and maybe your phone call class um, to, to do stuff. Um, but uh, but that but that, all that logic belongs off in your phone bill and phone call classes. This is just a client of those classes. It's also a server. Sorry. This is a, a, a th 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 this code uses uh, your classes to do its work, just the same way I'm using the map to do my work here. So this is all stuff that's happening on the server. Um, and actually, do I? I don't have an index.html. I meant to add. No, I don't. Oh, you know what? I, I meant to add something to this archetype, which was. An index.html that lets you work with the server, work with the servlet um, from the uh, web application. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm going to background my server. So it's sitting there running in the background. Sorry, you know what I just did there? Right? So it's like, I launched the application, um, I, but I want to use the command line, I want to use my shell and still have the application running, so I just put it in the background. Okay, so it's still running. As a matter of fact, we can see that. From here, we reload, and yes, it's still it's still running. Now I want to run my client. Now my client, um, I, do I have? Yes. Okay. Um, so I created what's called an executable jar, which means you can do stuff like this. Uh, oh, I haven't built it yet, though. Maybe in package. Actually, there's a couple of things here that I probably should explain. Oh, interesting. Uh, target. Okay. There's something called a WAR file, a web archive, which is basically a jar file with your WebXML in it. Um, 
and then also any third party jar files that you use. This is the thing that is so this is a, a deployable artifact that you can send that uh, that you can send to a web container. So what the Maven project does is it takes your servlet class and your WebXML and it puts it into this uh, foambuild.war file and that is what's deployed into Jetty and then Jetty will take that war file, uh, pull it apart, find the servlet, you know, sorry, read the web.xml, find the servlet, register everything so that everything's all nice and hooked up when you then hit the, uh, hit, hit the URL with your browser. This project also does something else. It creates a jar file. And the jar file is like the jar file that you built in uh, your, your project one, two, and three. It is the command line uh, uh, tool. And the way you invoke that is you say java-jar, and then you say target uh, phone bill jar, And this will run your, uh, your, your main method of your project four. So I'm just going to run it here. Um, it, uh, let's see here, key, I'm going to add a key value. Let's see what it's say. If no value is specified, then all the values are printed. If no key is specified, all key value uh, pairs are printed. Okay, so then um, the host is going to be localhost. The port is going to be 8080. Um, the key is, uh, let's just do the uh, number one and then the word one. So the key in the map will be the number of the string for the number one. The value will be the, the word one. Said it mapped one to one. What just happened there? I invoked, uh, I, I sent a post request, and we'll look at the details in a moment. I sent a post request to my server. So now, when I ask for all the mappings, oh look, I've got one to one. Similarly, I can ask the, uh, the, the command line, I can use the command line tool to find out the, the value of one. There it is. And I will just add a second one. And now I think if I have neither, oops, if I have neither command line, it'll print two for both of them. Can more, more than one key value pair. Like how you have one and Like on the command line, yeah. uh, so no, it only supports. Yep, yeah, that's gonna use run the client multiple times to create two of them. So I can do three and three. Anyway, and then it all shows up here on my server. You get how there are two Java programs running though, right? So my uh, my Jetty is still running there in the background. I can hit it with this client. I can hit it with the web browser client, and I can also hit it with my command line client. And you know what? The server doesn't care. Right, doesn't care that it's oh, it's Chrome that's you know asking for those key value pairs. Oh no, it's a Java program. It doesn't care. It just take, gets the HTTP request and sends the HTTP response, and that's all it needs to know. Okay, so how does that work? Project four. So the project four class is um, get rid of that. Project 4 class um, parses the command line, right? You've all seen stuff like this before. Uh, it parses out the port, it's gotta be an integer, blah, 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 blah. Oh, here's something interesting. Okay, it creates this, uh, it, it creates a new instance of something called phone bill rest client that takes the, uh, the name of the port. And what does it do with this phone bill rest client? Okay, so it's got this thing called client and uh, it has read the, parsed the command line arguments into variables like here's the key that, that was specified on the command line, here's the value that was specified on the command line. And so then it, uh, based on what was specified in the command line, it interacts with the client in different ways. So remember, this is the client, this is that thing running on the command line, it's still Java code, but it's running in a different process from the server. So if um, no key was specified, then it's going to invoke a method on the client that says, well, give me all the key value, give me all keys and values, and return something called a response. A response, this is my code, right? It's something that I wrote is off in the edupdx CS410J um, stuff in the examples uh, jar. Uh, that uh, it, it basically hides a lot of the details of working with URLs and the HTTP protocol. I think there are examples of it in the lecture also. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to call this get all keys and values uh, method on my client. If there's no key, if there's no value, I'll just get the values for the key. Here again, asking this of the client. And then if they're both specified, then I want to make a post 
and I'll do that inside the add key value pair. So what the client class does is it provides an abstraction over all of those URLs. Um, I do this to keep my, uh, my, my main class, my main method, as simple as possible, right? It's all a command line parsing, bleh, right? Um, but let's put all of the, the logic for dealing with the HTTP off in its own class um, so it can be responsible and so it can be reused, right? You know, maybe in project five, you'll write a, a, a graphical user interface for it or an Android application or, or so, you know, you could reuse it. Anyway, um, great. And so when I, uh, when I call this method, um, we'll take a look at the implementation in a minute, but underneath the covers, it's making the call off to the server. It's dealing with all the HTTP stuff and it returns to this other object that's called response, um, which uh, well, represents the response. And then you can do things like uh, check the response code for that, that came through. We want to make sure that it's HTTP okay. And what does it do? Well, if the code that we got from the response doesn't match the expected code, then it prints out an error message. While all this stuff is going on, well, IO exception is going to occur, right? You're doing IO over the network. It's kind of IO, and so if something goes wrong, it throws an IO exception. So you'll want to catch that IO exception. Um, and uh, well, here, you know, I print out an error message uh, if uh, you know if it occurs. If not, I'll print out the content. So this is what was returned by the server when I made that call. Print it out. Uh, get content is as a string. And I'll say system.exit0 because I'm happy. So really, so all this stuff up here is command line parsing. Not terribly interesting. But this code right here is interacting with the, uh, the web server. And there's a nice, a nice abstraction called the phone bill REST client. I recommend that you continue this abstraction in, uh, in, in your project. So this is like what the main, uh, what, what the main method does. Okay, now let's dig into some details about the phone bill REST client. The constructor, you give it a host name and a port, and it creates, uh, it, it populates a, um, a field, uh, well, so, yeah, a final, a final field uh, called URL, which is basically, well, the URL that you're going to interact with. And so this is the slash phone calls. I, know, I have these out, uh, extracted out as constants. I'm really not sure why, honestly. But this basically creates the you know, localhost colon 8080 slash web app is the phone bill slash servlet is calls. So there you've got the URL. Okay. So now, uh, oh, and notice that uh, this extends a class called HTTP Request Helper. This is a class that I wrote that takes care of doing all of that URL manipulation, all of the fetching from the URL and doing a post and all that stuff because while that's neat and everything like that, it's um, uh, more complex than I want you guys to deal with. Um, I want you to be able to understand what the abstractions do for you, um, figure out how to, you know, uh, probably what happens in the covers, but I don't want you to have to write it all yourself. That would be way more than was would be reasonable to expect in a, in a two-week project. Okay, so I create a URL, and now I've got these other methods back here in my client. When I say, hey, uh, give me all of the keys and values. How do I implement that? Well, I use the get method, which is inherited from that request helper, and it says, hey, do a get on the URL, um, this actually I think is overloaded to take up some more parameters. Um, uh, so get the URL, don't provide any uh, uh, parameters to the URL and return the response that it creates. Similarly, when I want to just get the values for a given key, I call get again with that URL, but now I'm gonna specify the, um, the HTTP parameter names and values there. So this will create a, uh, a get, well, this will create a URL that looks like, you know, something like this. So it'll say, you know, key equals one. Because in this case, the string, yeah, the, the, the value of this uh, parameter key is the string one. Add key value pair calls the post method, again, inherited from that helper class with the, the same old URL, and now it provides the key and the value that were, um, 
that were uh, specified here on the command line. A lot of the names of the variables and parameters are the same and stuff like that. Um, and so it might be a little confusing. I encourage you to spend some time with, with this code. So that's how the client works. A couple things I want you to take away. This abstraction uh, for phone bill REST client um, encourage you to leverage all the stuff in HTTP request helper, right? So you don't need to worry about what the get method does. As a matter of fact, well, here's the source code. It's all sorts of, you know, building up the query and making sure that you've got the question mark right. And um, then using like HTTP URL connection, which is a standard Java class for uh, making an HTTP request and handling it and blah, 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 blah. All very neat, great for you guys to look at on your own. This code I thought was uh, complex enough that I provided it for you. I don't say I never did anything for you. Okay. So, uh, and I think that's pretty much all of it. This is the skeleton that the archetype pr provides you with. Um, I, I think, and certainly based on previous experiences, I, I think this is enough to sort of get you started working with, uh, with, with, with servlets, with Java web applications. Um, I hope that as you're going through this, you're sort of envisioning how you will, uh, you know, implement your real project for uh, client and server, sort of what information needs to go back and forth. Um, and, and I hope that the abstractions uh, help you and ultimately don't get in your way. Um, but remember, the, the, the real uh, complexity here is in the fact that you're doing distributed programming. You've now got one application that has two, uh, two programs, two processes talking to one another. Um, and uh, I can't underscore this enough, this is hard. It really is exponentially more, right? Because you're used to sort of like dealing all with one thing. You've probably seen some like concurrent programming in your operating system scores. You've dealt with threads. Well, it's like that, right? Whereas like now instead of, um, instead of having sort of a linear, uh, yeah, instead of having a linear, okay, I start here in my program and I do this stuff and then I come back and everything like that. Now you've got two things happening at the same time. Luckily in this application, it's like, well, this guy goes and calls this guy and he does some stuff and then, you know, returns and stuff like that. Um, but still, it's two things to keep in your head. Um, but this is a really important skill to have and something that I think is completely appropriate for, um, you know, undergraduates like, like yourself and something that you're going to need to know because, you know, this is the way people develop applications these days, right? It's not just all, you know, command lines and text files and stuff. Okay. That was a lot. Any questions? Yeah. So you put Jenny in the background. How do you uh, actually clean uh, it? Uh, well, you can put it back in the foreground and control C it. Um, yeah, it, it'll clean it up. Um, there is a start and a stop, I think, too. If you refresh that browsing page, it's. <laughs> Frowny face. Oh, I never noticed that with the page down, it's kind of like a pirate and everything. It's going like an eye patch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my computer's got no memory, so these are some questions. Yeah, right, and so, yeah, right, and you, and you are running more so two Java virtual machines. It's, yeah, it's not tiny uh, these days. Let's see here. Anything else? Who, oh, someone asked a question, someone sent me an email about this uh, with some questions. Did those answer your questions? Or you just generate a bunch more? Okay. Um, well, I recorded it all, and so you can go watch it on the YouTube later. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, does search return also like the name of the customer in the phone bill or just the calls themselves? It pretty prints it. Pretty prints the bill. Oh, uh, so yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a pretty print output, which I assume contains the name of the customer. Yeah. But only the phone calls. Right. Only the phone calls between those two date ranges. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, and, and that's another thing. So if it wasn't bad enough and now you're doing distributed programming, oh, there's a little bit more functionality I want you to add to the, yeah, 13 points, come on. This is valuable stuff. It's, yeah. Okay. Let's take a little break, and then we'll come back. We'll talk about the next kata for a little bit, and then we'll uh, break up into groups and do some more uh, mob and pair programming. Uh, I hope that this will be a, a better introduction to TDD or a better initial experience with TDD than it was last week. Okay, thanks. See you in a bit. Thank you.